Hey, welcome to um, uh, this uh, church hall today for our discussion about mass adjustment changes at our Holy Family Parish. Well, let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good and gracious God, on this traditional feast of St. Joseph today, we thank you for uh, allowing our parish to be so named uh, Holy Family in honor of your Son, Jesus Christ, and his parents, Mary and Joseph. We celebrate today the Feast of St. Joseph, and we also celebrate a continued Lenten journey towards Jesus' passion, suffering, and resurrection. Help us as we continue our discussions about uh, changes or adjustments in our parish so that we might always be able to prepare a place, a home for your son, Jesus Christ, and for all those who come to worship and listen and follow him. We ask this in his name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so welcome again. And I think there are a few more people coming down from the church still, so they'll be just uh, coming down shortly. Uh, Sharon Hackman is here. I just want to introduce her. She actually works for the Diocese of Pittsburgh. Um, the Diocese of Pittsburgh has um, five consultants? Yes. Five consultants um, who work for parish services, the Department of Parish Services. And each of the consultants has any number of parishes in the diocese where they're available to call on for help um, through any diocesan process that we have. So today we're going through a process in our diocese for adjusting our weekend mass uh, schedule. And so Sharon's here to um, share a little bit of the process, a little bit of the, um, the, 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 the statistics and information that will help us understand what it is and we're going through and why it is we're going through that. Um, so she's here to help facilitate that. I'm really here primarily to listen, um, but I did want to introduce this because, um, you know, when, whenever we go through changes in our earthly lives, in our, in our personal lives, we have to deal with adjustments at different times in our life. For those of you who are parents, the first time you had a child, uh, you probably had a dramatic change in your household, right? You had to readjust everything. You had to put up um, fences and you know childproof cabinets and everything. And you had to rearrange your schedules and your lives for that child that was a, a, a new entrance to your home. And so that happened with every subsequent child. For those of you who had four children, you have to buy a new car too, right? Because they don't all have the same car. And then of course, um, you know, for those of you who have been blessed to become God grandparents, um, the same thing happens. If you, especially if you live near your grandkids. Um, you become automatically the first first call for babysitting, right? And uh, so you have to be available and to adjust if you're empty nesters, you have to adjust your lives again to be able to watch children with older bodies and older bones and things like that too. So, um, so there's always adjustments in our lives at different turning points, at different uh, ways that we have to adjust our personal lives. Well, we as Holy Family Parish um, are um, re evaluating a need to change our weekend mass schedule not because we want change, but because we have a need. We have a uh, change probably coming in the number of priests we'll have avail available to our parish. Um, if you've seen me, um, Father Kevin, your pastor, um, you can see me running around, mostly the Regency neighborhood of, of Plum, because that's where I live. Um, but I literally run around, I'm healthy, I exercise every day. Um, but then you notice, if you've been to any of our weekend masses, um, that we have um, three other priests regularly. We have. Father David and Father George, who are both battling all kinds of physical incapacities. Father George, in addition to his challenges before December of last year when he was diagnosed with cancer, now he's also dealing with um, the chemotherapy and, and the prognosis and the diagnosis as it moves forward with him and his, his challenges. And uh, so we obviously have two priests that are older and aging. Um, uh, Father David is just a little bit older than Father George. Um, he's actually eligible for retirement um, this fall. And uh, Father George, not far behind that. So we really need to envision that, you know, with the number of priests available, and we'll talk about that in a minute, um, the number of available, priests available in our diocese, that we probably won't have three priests in our parish, uh, assigned to our parish, for a long time. So we're going to go from three down to two at some point uh, in the next several months, uh, maybe a year, but in the next several months probably. We're blessed to have Father Ginto who is a student, his primary job is to be a student. Uh, we're blessed to have the Benedictines coming to help us, um, but, but really we're supposed to rally around the priests that are assigned to our parish, which is going to you know, probably change from three to two in the next several months. So we're going through this process, um, gonna hear some information 
Um, like I said, my job is to really listen to you and the, the table discussions and the feedback that you'll, present, you'll be presenting, your facilitators will share at the end, um, so that um, I and then the pastoral council and the other parish leadership and clergy team will come up with the best schedule with what we can with our resources. So with that, thank you again for your presence and Sharon Hefner, if you'd like to help lead us through some of the presentation. Thank you, Father. It's a pleasure to be here with everyone. Glad to share the morning, early afternoon with you. Okay. All right, so a little bit about our agenda, what we'll be doing in our time together. So I will be sharing with you some of our national diocesan and current parish realities so we understand and have some background for the changes that will be made. There will be two small group discussions during our time together. Each of your tables has a facilitator, and they will be recording what you offer in response to the questions, so that later on the leadership of the parish can consider all that you've had to say when they are making adjustments to that mass schedule. Uh, following the discussions and the remainder of the presentation, there will be table reports. So the facilitator for each table will be sharing some of the highlights of what were discussed at your table. So you get a sense of what other people are saying and are talking about, maybe concerned about, etc. And finally, we'll finish up by talking about what are our next steps, where do we go from here, and Father Kevin will offer some closing remarks. So we will begin with a snapshot of our current realities, talking about national information, diocesan information, and parish information. So we learned from our first session together when we were at St. Irenaeus that folks want to know where are we getting this data from? So I want to tell you a little bit about that. So the national data, the majority of that comes from CARA, um, C-A-R-A, which is the Center for Applied Research, as, um, as I think it's association, or I Sounds can't remember good. what the last day is for, but um, so Center for Applied Research. And then also some of the national information comes from CLI, Catholic Leadership Institute, and they draw a lot of their information from an organization that is called Pew Research, Pew, P-E-W, like the seats we sit in upstairs. So Pew Research. And then our diocesan information, our diocesan statistics are gathered by each parish reporting their numbers into us and then we collate that so we have the numbers for the whole diocese. And so your parish numbers come from what is called the October count. So if you think back into the fall and you can recall the ushers going down the aisles and counting heads through, we, through we the church. We actually do it every weekend. Okay, so you do it every weekend, so that's more than that. But what the diocese actually collects up is the weekends through October, and they average those, and that gives a count for the parish for average mass attendance. So those are the basic statistics for that. All right, so a little bit about understanding our parish life. So there are approximately 200, or 22 million Catholics in the United States that fall into the category that's called boomers. So you, you hear that different generations have titles for what their generation is. So the white hairs like myself and older than me are considered the baby boomers and the traditionalists before us. Generations like Father Kevin and under that um, start with Generation Xers and go down to Generation Zs. And so of that 60% of the 200, or the 22 million, I'm sorry, I, I keep saying 200, 22 million, about 60% of those Catholics are practicing. So that's about 13 million folks who practice. And you understand that your church has a lot of people registered on your church books, but that's different than the number of people that actually come and participate. So we're talking about the participating folks. Of the next generations of the Gen Xers, 
about 30% are practicing, and that's about 4.8 million. So actually, the research bears out to tell us of all of these folks, about five to seven percent of parishioners are actually the really active ones, and most of those are made up of boomers. And there's where our biggest source of contributions for the uh, church are, and also for the volunteers that we have for the kinds of things that we do. And even amongst this number, this 60 to 70 percent and the 30 percent, about 13% of those are folks that attend once or twice a month. So like one foot in and already another foot out the door. Um, about 10% of those are folks who attend weekly, but from the notion of they see this as an obligation. And then that leaves about the five to 7% who really are fully engaged in the parish. And so that's what we wanna focus on going forward is increasing that number of five to 7% of folks who are really engaged in parish life. We also see some more statistics and very startling. So research tells us that about 91% of our children will leave the practice of the faith. There's been a dramatic shift since the 1990s. There are 55% less Catholic marriages and correspondingly with that, less baptisms. About one in five children who are baptized will not receive First Communion. And about two of five baptized will not be confirmed. And research is bearing out that 85% of our children will stop practicing the faith by the time they are the age of 21. We want to look at some sacramental trends now in our diocese. So we're going to pay particular attention to this line that's called October count. And that's the numbers that we count up in our parishes every year. That's all of the numbers added up throughout the diocese. And we see a big difference in number. So back in 2018, a little over 120,000 people were regular mass attenders. And we see that in 2022, a little shy of 70,000 are attending. So that is a big difference, about 42% less than what we have. And in a little bit, we'll get a picture of what's behind this and, and how this, this came about. We also see at that bottom line, the ratios of baptisms to death. So in 2018, for every one baptism we had, we had two funerals. And in 2022, for every baptism we have, we're still kind of holding the same across the diocese. We'll see a little bit different for your parish. Father Kevin, if you would. Oh, you did? Okay, I'm sorry. Holy Family Parish. Okay, so here are your statistics for your parish. Again, we want to focus on October count. So back in 2018, 3,165 folks attending, and in 2022, 1,789 attending. And we look at the ratio of baptisms to deaths. In 2018, it was one baptism for every two funerals, and in 2022, it's one baptism for every three funerals. So we see the aging population. And actually, this is not limited to just your parish, but the research is telling us that next to Dade County in Florida, Pittsburgh has the largest population of elderly, so second in the nation. So that's going to have impact. It's going to have impact. Yes? So how much does COVID impact that? We're going to look at that in just a minute, okay? All right, so here's the next slide. So to try to understand this a little bit, let me um, talk a bit about background to all of this. So our culture is dramatically shifting. And I think if you just look around, you can see that more and more increasingly, our, our culture is hostile towards faith. 
And so the age that you and I grew up in, the parish life and the culture that we were familiar with, what was called Christendom, is not now part of the dominant culture. And so we are experiencing a cultural shift, moving from Christendom into an apostolic age. So if you think back to the early church, what happens in an apostolic age? Because the word is not heard by many people out in the dominant society that precipitates a need for us to move from inside to outside, to preach the gospel, to help people understand who this Jesus is and invite them into the kind of life that's going to sustain grace and um, commitment and love of Jesus with them. So with that as the backdrop, we're going to look at some of the specific things inside the church that have impacted, inside and out actually, that have impacted our numbers and our percentages. So we're going to pay attention to this top column and we are going to read from right to left. So in 2017-2018, the attendance in the parish was 3,419. We see um, the what enters in is the grand jury report and that does have impact because we see in the time period a year later in 2018, 2019, we are now at 3,165 3, attending. And so we see that there is a drop of about 250 in our parish attendance. So we move on a little bit more and we see um, the pre-pandemic stage but also at this time is when we begin on mission and the mergers, and not everyone likes that, and so there is impact again. So with this stage, we see that there is about 450 in the drop of parishioners that attend. Then entering in, in 2020, we encounter the pandemic. And so with the pandemic, since no one was in church, we didn't take October counts. But following that in 2021, when we were resuming worship in church, the mass account attendance is 1,660. Big difference from the pre-pandemic stage. Now we see people are starting to come back a little bit more than what they were. So in our current year, or um, prior to this, in 2022, we see a little bit of an increase. So about 129 more folks coming than were coming when we first opened up. So dramatic impact here. And this could get a little depressing when we look at those numbers, but lest we be discouraged, I want to draw our attention to other times in our faith. So if we think back to um, early scriptural times, there was a time that was called the exile in the Old Testament. And people spent 70 years in exile out of Jerusalem. So think about 70 years before God put it on the heart of one of the foreign kings to allow those people to return to Jerusalem for the temple to be rebuilt and there was a lot of unknowns when that was happening, but God placed that on that king's heart. And the prophet Jeremiah was sent to speak to the people to remind them, for I know well the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare and not for your woe, plans to give you a future filled with hope. So even in spite of this news, we need to keep in mind that God is always with us, that we are a people of hope, and beyond the Old Testament, we look to the New Testament, and we look to Jesus himself, who says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and that's how we will find our path forward with hope. Yes. I'm sorry. Can I ask a question about yes, the previous sure. slide? Does um, 
the number of people who tune into the live stream count in there in any way? We, across the diocese, we record the people in the pews. Okay. So it's actually that. I know that you, you do have people that watch on TV receive communion in the parking lot. I am aware of that. But to kind of compare oranges to oranges across the diocese, it is a count of people actually in the pews because not everybody offers those other options. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So there is a corresponding phenomenon to lesser people in the pews. There are also a lesser number of clergy. So our diocese has 166 priests with active assignments in ministry. If we look at the columns with the ages, if we look at these two on the right side, so the orange one is um, ages 60 to 69, there are 56 of those, and there are 33 of our priests that are 70 plus. And so together that gives us 89 of the 166 that are age 60 and above. If you look to the column preceding that, ages 50 to 59, there's an additional 32. So if we add these three columns together, we see 121 of our priests, 50 and above. We only have 45 clergy in the diocese who are under age 50. So we have an aging priestly population and that has impact. So Father Kevin, I don't know if you want to add to that or if you already spoke to that. Spoke to that. Yeah, I, I already kind of identified. I, I think everybody's very visible, uh, very aware because of the visible, visit, the, the visual image of our priests of what our situation is. We got one healthy priest and two other priests that are challenged with a lot of things. Um, and uh, uh, that's going to be continue to be a challenge for them and for us. Uh, and so uh, thank you for your prayers for, for the Father George and Father David as they go through their health challenges. Um, grateful to the Knights of Columbus. They're putting in a, a stair lift at the rectory for to Father David so we can get up and down to his apartment a little, a little bit more ease. Um, but we, we have to deal with those realities. But we also have to deal with the reality that's confronting us that we're, we're not going to get two priests to replace the two close to retirement priests for probably one. Uh, so you're going to have a chance for discussion, I think, in a second here. Um, respond to this information you received so far. There will be lots of chances to talk about um, what you think we ought to do about it all later on. But if you could just respond to the information, the questions that are before you the next, uh, the next time. Okay. So and just to put this in perspective, it is not only your parish that is encountering this, but across the diocese shortly, there will be parishes that have three priests will go to two, <coughs> parishes that have two priests will go to one. And that's the reality of our situation and what we need to prepare for moving forward. So we're going to um, spend about 15 minutes in discussion. The questions, discussion questions are up here. They're also on pages at your table because I know it's not easy to read everything from where you're sitting so you can have a paper copy. And the role of the facilitators is to record what you have to say. So I will be keeping time. I will remind when we're about halfway through that 15 minutes, when we're at five minutes and at two minutes. All right, so if we can begin to do that. So we're going to gather back together and go up to the house. I'm going to be back a little bit later. Well, Kevin, you want to advance one for me, please? All right, so now we're doing where we need to go from here. So a quote from Bishop Zubik reminding us that the reason Catholic parishes exist is to help us to develop a relationship with our Lord. So we talked about that shift from Christendom to an apostolic age. Big piece of that is being able to go out and talk to others about Jesus and about your, your faith. 
So if you don't know, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that's going to be pretty hard to do. So that's first order for everybody to develop that deeper relationship with Jesus. And there is a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. So think about um, your dearest friend, the relationship that you have with them and how well you know them. That is how well we need to know Jesus. Thinking about when you were a young child, who was the person that loved you the most? When you think about that person and that kind of love, that really empowers us to be able to go forward and do things. Think of the love of that person gives us the courage and the encouragement to be able to go out. So we need to have that kind of relationship as a basis to begin with because we want to, in our parishes, equip disciples, parishioners, to go out and share the good news. And Bishop Zubik reminds us that this honestly will take because we want to make the shift from maintenance from just doing parish life the way it has always been to mission and ministry. And so he's reminding us that this takes an attitude shift where we have to learn to refocus all of our activity on mission and on ministry. So planning for the future, a couple things will help. So everything that you do, so changing the mass schedule is not in isolation. It fits overall with the plan for the parish for the future. And so you already have a parish plan, but you will also be engaged in some activities with CLI. So you've seen in the bulletin, and hopefully most of you have taken part in the Disciple Maker Index Survey. And if you haven't, I encourage you to do that. But that is going to give feedback again to your parish leadership so that they will be able to adjust the plan that you have and, and better um, plan for the future. Also, beginning in May, and you'll be hearing about that in the relatively um, near future, your parish is one of the 22 in our diocese that has opted to participate in Next Generation Parish. This is an opportunity that Catholic Leadership Institute provides for parishes free of charge. They have a huge grant from the Lilly Foundation to do this. And what they do is provide four years of accompaniment for a parish with implementing their pastoral plan and getting their parish in, in good order for um, being evangelizing and disciple makers for the future. All right, so planning for the future, we want to talk about, so we realize now there are some new realities in our parish lives. We, we have to do something with those current realities that we need, we heard about today. So that impacts us by making mass schedule adjustments in our parish. A reminder that any of the adjustments are part of that overall plan and that those changes that we will be suggested, so what your parish will do will provide one or two possibilities of what the new schedule could look like. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a little bit, but that's not gonna be a, a willy-nilly kind of decision. It's going to be carefully studied and prayerfully considered before we get to something that not just serves one church, but that serves the whole, all of our parish. Okay, Father Kevin. All right, so I want you to know a little bit about the parish mass schedule guidelines. So what, what kind of, if you will, governs what we need to do when we're making changes with masses. So a little bit of context behind this. In the early church, when we started out, the experience was that the entire community gathered around the bishop for Sunday worship. So that was an experience. It was a visible sign of the unity of the church because everyone was gathered together. Over the centuries, as the church grew, that was not always possible. So we began to gather around the parish priest in local communities. But the one thing we cannot forget, we cannot lose that original sense of unity. So that's what we need to be focused on. We are one. 
And that's something that we need to be able to convey in any of the mass schedule decisions that we make. Pope Francis also reminds us that every aspect of that liturgy is important. The space we find ourselves in, the, the time that we're going to have, the, the gestures that we use, the, the garb that the priests and the liturgical ministers um, wear, the music that we have. And so, you know, at one of the other parishes, one of the things that I heard came up in some of these discussions were the fact that ooh, not at all of our places, we're, we don't always have a lector or whatever the case may be, or Eucharistic ministers or some other ministers available. So that is another good reason to stop and say, if we want to get at the unity, we want to have the number of masses where we're going to have that kind of participation available and where we can see a visible sign of unity. So in the Pittsburgh Diocese with the guidelines, number one and number two are the most significant for your parish. Number one talks about that the number of masses that our uh, parish is able to have is determined by the availability of the priests that are assigned full time to the parish and the size of the parish community. So that's why some parishes get three, some parishes get two clergy assigned. It's based on the availability and the size of the community. And there is also the um, rule, if you will, or the guideline, let me say it that way, that for each active priest in the parish, each active full-time priest in the parish, there should be no more than three masses for that person. So that, that is to be considered. And then the quality of that experience. So to create a sense of unity. And if you're looking around and you're saying, our places of worship are less than 50% full, then again, that's something to consider because having everybody together is a better, more unified experience. Okay, um, some other things. Pay attention to the number of Saturday evening masses. Lots of times those are for convenience, but really the emphasis is on the Sunday, so they're saying to give more consideration to the Sunday Masses, still doing the number of anticipated Masses Saturday evening that you need to. Also in decisions, to be mindful of trying to allow 90 minutes between Masses so that priests can get from one location to another. And so they're not flying out the door the minute the Mass is over, so they at least get to say hello to people. Or if somebody has a, a concern or they want the priest to pray over them, um, that there's some time for some of that. So to be mindful of those kinds of things. Also that every Sunday Mass should make use of um, the ordained in the parish, so the priest and the deacons, as well as the baptized in all of those different roles. Readers, servers, musicians, greeters, ushers, extraordinary ministers. What was that? Well, we're going to go to the next slide. Okay. Before we do that, it's going to be a chance okay. for more discussion. Um, but I want to remind everybody before we go to that discussion section um, that this process, now Sharon just shared, there's a diocesan process, right? But the process that we're going to go through, these are some of the guidelines, but this is our process. So we are going to come up with the solution in our parish. We're not going to change you know, the whole outside statistics, all the, all the outside stuff that's out there. So for example, um, uh, while I'm not in the higher category of the aging priests, I am 55 years old. No woman would have me at this point if I were married. <laughs> we're not going to have, we're not going to start ordaining married men. We're not going to have women priests. We're not going to have priests coming from the Philippines. That's not within our power, right? What was it within our power is adjusting our masses to meet what we have, the uh, number of people that we have, the number of altar servers, ministers, lectors, as she mentioned, the number of priests and number of people so that we have good and vibrant liturgies. So that's what we're focusing on, what we can do in our parish, not what the Pope or the Bishop can do, all right? So let's focus on that because we're following this process and it's gonna be our process and what we decide in the end. So me with the parish leadership, ultimately you can blame me in the end, what happens? <laughs> but but the, hopefully your, your words today 
your discussion, your feedback will help all of the leadership of the parish help me come to the best solution for us. Okay, so we're going to allow 20 minutes for this, and there are five questions. So let me say to you, number one is a yes or no. If two minutes in, you're still on number one, move on. <laughs> two and three are really about what are your thoughts about this. Number four is about not focusing on what we think, but how are we going to help the rest of our parishioners understand that? So how are we going to be a part of the solution rather than a part of the problem? And finally, number five, anything else that you want to add or mention or bring up? So certainly you say what is on your heart, but let's not get lost in the weeds. Let's focus on the questions that we need to answer. Thank you. And I'll call time again. Deacon in the back. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, uh, we had a lot of good discussion here. Uh, first of all, what are the current realities? Is most breaking to you? We said the statistics were shocking. We, you know, they didn't realize that there was uh, a lot of those things happening, not only around the, uh, the parish, but also in the country itself. Uh, and then the question is, are we getting new families? Because even when you look at some of the statistics, did they adjust it accordingly because of births going down and all kinds of things of what's really affecting People not coming, and then the, the obvious one was clear clear that something needs to be done at this point in time. Uh, how do you think the current realities will affect the future? We need to look at the masses that have also some attention to those that we're trying to bring back into the parish because those that are there will help evangelize once they get there. We talked about things like handicapped children, young people, young families, uh, young couples also. Uh, work with priests to allow times for them to relax also and, and have some downtime between the masses so they're just not running from lo one location to the other and they can make sure that there's enough time for them to make the mass. Uh, and also, uh, can we bring the people back, especially young people, in whatever we do to adjust the schedule? Uh, the other one was, will Catholic schools grow and foster an increase in people attending mass? That was something that we really thought about because with the political nature that we have now, a lot more people are giving their attention to Catholic schools, so can we utilize that? Um, after today's presen uh, presentation, do you understand the reason why adjustments are needed? The answers were yes, very clearly. Uh, what's the most challenging about adjusting the mass schedule? Uh, looking out for the special individuals that we're trying to draw back. Uh, one mass in each church on a weekend. If we intend to keep them open, we need to make sure that happens. And um, the limit of the number of masses being based on the number of priests if we have two, that means we can only have six. We can't adjust it to nine based on us potentially using other, other priests like the Benedictines, et cetera. So that was a major concern. Uh, what's the most important consideration in determining uh, weekends? Um, that it's to adjust the time to encourage attendance, whatever that is, whether it's by you know adjusting the time to make it better for young people, for people who can't do something at night because driving in the dark, et cetera. Uh, we should direct it towards, like we said, the young people, the young families, and bringing people back that have left the Catholic faith, at least temporarily. Um, late masses have to consider the older population and prayer, especially for vocation. Thank uh, you. So, uh, okay. <laughs> what suggestion do you have for helping Christians understand why the actions will be taken? Communication, communication, communication. That was their big thing. Uh, clear, concise communication of the parish statistics. Just don't just publish in the bulletin, but really try to explain what they mean. Maybe even try doing some slides on live streaming. Uh, somehow that we do that at the front end like we advertise, just to put them out there. And the other suggestion was any communication we do should be direct and simple. Okay. All right. Other comments? None. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. We're going to go to this table here. everyone is no one was surprised by anything so the numbers numbers were startling but everybody knew that they were bad so um, um, some of the other things that were really striking to people um, that we were losing as many young people like we knew that we were losing young people but not 80 to 90 percent that was really high um, the current realities that reflect the future um, the mass schedule 
we have to realize that when we adjust mass schedules, we actually might see a decline for a little while too, where we get people that come back. Some people are going to be upset when their mass is gone and they're not they're not going to adjust right away. Um, we also one of the other things that might affect are the volunteers. We need more volunteers, but if you take away the mass that they volunteer at, so we have to make sure that we encourage everyone like that. Um, one of the biggest challenges that we're, that we're facing is just satisfying the group and making sure that there's fairness across the board at every church. Um, no one feels slighted that this church still has two masses and this one doesn't have any now. Like we have to be, make sure that we're really doing that. And one of the biggest things is just to, when we're giving the message, that we make sure that we're positive and that we're encouraging. And when people are at the back of the church, whether it's pastoral council or ushers or somebody else, and people are complaining to us, <laughs> that we're like, oh yeah, isn't that terrible? That we have to also, if, if we're helping here, we have to be the people encouraging everyone, saying, yeah, but we see this, it, it'll be okay, and we always have to be positive. So the, not only coming down from the pastor, but even the people helping, that that's a very, very important part. That's basically it. So. Thank you for that. Appreciate that very well. Good. Yes, please. Um, pretty much everything we discussed has been has been already discussed. Um, we did address uh, uh, the comment that Father had made that we are not we are not um, here to talk about global things that can be done, like looking at ordaining women and priests that can marry. So we, we did touch on that, um, but now rec of course recognizing that that's not what we're we're trying to do here. But with regard to um, the, the, what the realities, how the reality, what do we think about that? We, we also said the same thing. They're striking, they're, um, it's a dramatic decline in the Catholics and attending, you know, those, those numbers, they, they hit you in the face. Um, and with, real, with um, regard to what do you think the current realities, will, how will they affect the future? Well, you know, just look around. The boomers, as the boomers are dying off, um, so is going to go the church unless we do something drastic to bring in the new people and the young families and concentrate on that. And that's that's really where our challenge is. And, and we did discuss very briefly um, the booming attendance at our non-denominational Reformation churches, which are kind of straddling us, one on 22 and one down over here. And what are they doing? Why do they have so many people? Like, and a lot, if you talk to a lot of the young people in our, in our congregations, it's because they find the services aren't uplifting, the um, restrictions that we have in the Catholic, what they call the restrictions in the Catholic Church is because of our practices. Those are things we can't change. But, you know, maybe there are some things that we can look at from the way these churches operate and say, how can we incorporate a little bit of that to bring some of the young people around? Um, pretty much, we we all understand at this table that you know we all understand the presentation, and um, what are the most challenging things about adjusting the mass schedule? We kind of, we spend a lot of time talking about flexibility. You know that's a big thing. It, we have to all be flexible, and we have to get that message out that people need to be flexible, and, and you can't just always say I'm only going to Our Lady Joy, I'm only going to six o'clock mass. Know, because that's where we're going to run into brick walls. Um, and again, and we said the same thing about education. It, it, the, we have to get this out online. We have to get it out in print. Um, I know Father mentioned to me real quickly that a lot of this information is going to be put out probably in the bulletins or in some sort of mailing. And it, it, it needs to be consolidated so people don't have to say, well, I saw this much in this bulletin and this much because then they won't, you know, people won't piece it together. And also recognize that the bulletin is only reaching the people who pretty much are coming to church or the people who are running in just to get a bulletin, which I've seen that happen. Thank you. Okay, this table here. I'll just cover <clears throat> the things that, that haven't been said. Uh, some of the current realities, uh, which stood out was that 85% of the young people stopped going to church uh, after their when at the age 21. The other thing that stood out was the uh, pre-jury attendance versus October 22. 
50% drop in attendance, uh, which really stood out. Some of the realities, uh, we've heard this before and I'll mention it again, flexibility of Catholics. Uh, we feel as though the administrators, the managers in the church are gonna have to take on a much larger role that the priests take on now and the priest will probably have to do just masses and sacraments as to what they can do. Uh, moving on to the challenges. Uh, uh, boomers do not like change. <laughs> Again, this was mentioned, fairness, equal consideration of all the churches. And we also feel there should be a 50%, at least 50% capacity at the churches. Some of the more important considerations, uh, uh, whatever churches stay open, there must be an equal division amongst the churches. That gets back again to fairness. Uh, uh, the, the other consideration is attendance. The other cons considerations we talked about was the, the geographic location of the churches, the distance between the churches have to be all considered. What are suggestions for helping other parishioners understand what's going on? Uh, town hall meetings like we have now. Uh, uh, parishioners, again, have to be open-minded. Another thing we have to consider is the fact we're talking about boomers, and we're all boomers. And there are a lot of boomers that are physically need help in going to church. So I think our church is going to have to be learn how to provide transportation. I know there's a lot of uh, litigation issues in providing transportation, but I think if, if we have closures and we want 50% attendance in the churches, we are going to have to provide transportation for some of these people. Uh, the realization that we're gonna be down to uh, two priests, and then uh, Marita was talking about communications. Uh, we have people that come to church that will take bulletins at home, some read them, uh, the young people will be on the website. So it's very important that mailers are gonna to have to be uh, very extensive in what we communicate to parishioners. Did I forget anything? We'll need discussions we need at People, it's really not going to hit people until we're actually down to two priests oh, yeah, and right. the reality actually sets in. And then they're going to really pay attention yes. to what's going on. Okay, thank you. All right, let's move over here. <coughs> well, I just first want to say that I had a really great table. It was, we had a great discussion and it was, it was nice working with them. Um, I think uh, in terms of the current reality, something that, that was a big part of our discussion, um, and before I get into that, they actually had a lot of uh, extra questions that I hope I was able to, to help them with. But um, the live stream, um, there are concerns that we offer too much live streaming to the point where people are choosing to replace um, the mass with, with the live stream. Um, they were deeply concerned about the health of our current priests, and especially Father Kevin. Um, let me see what else here. They were encouraged to notice a lot of uh, new faces so they're, lo they're noticing a lot of new faces, especially um, as they travel around to different masses and getting to know people. As far as um, you know, creating a new mass schedule, um, they think the biggest opposition is gonna be not my mass, not my church, okay? Um, there are concerns about the 6 p.m. liturgy at, uh, at St. John's that uh, it's, not, it's not well attended, but we wanna make sure that we are still accommodating the Latino community. Um, we want to make sure that we focus a bit on CCD. We do have CCD uh, at uh, two places on Sunday. We need to make sure there is at least one mass situated around CCD for the families. And um, as far as the communication, um, you know, the, the, we recognize that there was, I don't know, what is there, there's got to be like maybe 60 people in this room, I'd say, and we have 14,000 parishioners, so we need to make sure that they are seeing the same information. It was very helpful to them in understanding everything. We noticed that we're also, we uh, recorded this so it can be presented back for people to watch, and uh, we think that is going to be effective. Thank you. Let's 
go to the table there. Okay. So the um, current reality will affect the future. Um, of course, if we're going to have some type of a reduction of mass schedule, the, the next question would be merging or closing of, of actual churches. I mean, the fact that you would have all the churches open in the Um As far as the challenges for adjusting the mass schedule, again, uh, voicing balance and fairness through the process. Balance and fairness through the process. And um, honesty and transparency, both on the diocesan and parish level. In the communication um, section, concise and informative bullets that don't, you know, even though some people love graphs and charts and numbers, some people get lost in them and they shut off. Um, something other than bulletin, because if people aren't coming to church, they're not seeing the bulletin, even though they might get it online. Um, another point that was brought up, which was interesting, is that um, a lot of people that don't, aren't engaged, or don't come to these types of things, um, kind of feel that decisions are already made, and what's, what's the difference? What would it matter? They've already made the decision. Through a lot of the process, not just the mass schedule process, so that was interesting. And also to have prayer services that would involve um, praying for people to come back to the church, to get more involved. Excuse me, Don, can you stand up and speak up? Because you're the furthest distance. <laughs> Sorry. You're usually not told to speak up. <laughs> uh, we weren't really surprised by any statistics. I guess maybe uh, surprised a little bit on the, the size of the scandal impact uh, that we had on the, on, the, on the decline. And maybe the other one was how the degrade, I call it degrading of the Catholic Church. Uh, how do we think the current reality will affect the future? Uh, one of the big comments that I heard was if we offer less, we're going to get less. So I think we need to be uh, concerned. We need to be really careful. Uh, that's pretty much it from the uh, uh, that part. The, the second part, the big yes on the understanding. Uh, what would be the challenges about the mass schedule? Obviously, as we've all been brought up, geography, the age of our parishioners, and making sure that we have uh, convenient times and that they can be quality so that no uh, Try to do one mass at least if we're going to keep five churches. We have one mass in each church. Um, one of the most important considerations in determining a weekend mass schedule, I think it's the same thing. We were talking about equality. Uh, we don't want to make sure that we, uh, you know, people can be tempted to leave. Uh, I know this is for so close to Mother of Sorrows. Maybe they've got a more convenient mass. I'm sure they go to Mother of Sorrows. Or I think you're, you're over in Air Nation, you've got churches close to Fox Chapel. So we're going to go where it's supposed to be. Suggestions for helping parishioners, and as we've always said, the big thing is transparency. Give, give them all the information. Uh, make sure that they uh, they have all the data there in front of them, and uh, to be transparent with it all. So. Okay, thank you. Final table. Okay. So the first part, you know, people are very concerned, um, and they're worried and sad with the current situation, and they're not surprised at this. Statistics, and um, and we need to do more about the young people coming to church, and to promote youth groups and being um, stronger and having better education. And in the future, we're basically afraid that we will lose more people to non-Catholic churches who are more active. And also, everyone is concerned about which masses would go away, and everyone has their favorites. And people fear that Our Lady Joy will lose an early mass. Um, and they are also concerned, as everyone said, more people will leave. And to consider which are the most attended and which um, will have the priest be available and with 90 minutes in between and the people also stated that the things they miss the most is the priests at the end of mass to say hello and you enjoyed your ho their homily and that type of thing um, and everyone of course wants to see their their own people um, so basically we all
all you know, thought the same thing and everyone shared already. Thank you. Okay, so a little bit about next steps and then Father will have some closing remarks. So you can see there are three parts to this process. What's occurring during Lent? So we're right in the midst of that. Actually, today we've just completed the last of the parish meetings. And so what happens now in step number two? So we're going to gather all the feedback from all three of these and consolidate that so that your parish leadership will be able to look at that and consider that and come up with one, two, three proposals of um, mass schedules. That will come back to the parish again in meetings similar to this, but um, during the Easter period, so not Easter Sunday, but in that whole season after Easter. Sometime during that period, we'll do meetings again for you to hear about the proposals and offer feedback on those the same way you did today. And with that in mind, then in the fall, so it's late summer, early fall, make it to one proposal. And that proposal is to be sent to the regional vicar who has the final say on that. So let me talk about that. So Father Kevin says this is your process. Yes, the vicar is not gonna tell you, you have to have mass at this time or this place or whatever. What he does is he reviews the process. So he looks at the guidelines and says, you know, are, are, did you consider the number of priests corresponding to the number of masses? Did you consult with the people? Did people have a chance to offer feedback? Mm -hmm. So where the, where the vicar would weigh in would be things like, okay, you have this number of priests, and so maybe more than six, you know, because there's a parish need, and you're gonna make a case about that. But right now you have 12 masses, and that was based on when you had four clergy members. So if you're coming with a proposal that's saying, now we're gonna have 11, Vicar's probably gonna say, you need to think about that some more and, and make that a little bit more realistic with the number of priests you're gonna have in the future. It's those kinds of things. So he's not determining what the parish is gonna do with those masses, but he is making sure that you're honoring that process. Or if he would observe that just these proposals appeared out of nowhere and no one had a chance to hear about this or to offer feedback and be saying you got to go back there and, and you got to give people more chance to weigh in on this so that's what the vicar does in this process yes does that vicar have a name yes is that person religious like a priest yes and is there one vicar for the entire diocese? yes there are two vicariates in the diocese <laughs> Northern and a Southern vicariat, and you'll all be delighted to hear the vicar for your vicariat. His last name is Pecking, so it's Father David Pecking, Father's brother. Yes, it's no big secret. My brother is the vicar for our region. There are two regions. Um, so, as as Sharon said, uh, I, the vicar will have to review the process. I'm sure because he is my brother he'll probably also have somebody else in the diocese on the, on the bishop's staff somewhere review to make sure that it's not just the brother of the, the, the parish. Um, so, uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, sure. Sharon did a great job with all three of these. Thank you very much. For you know, I think, you know, as I said, the second meeting, and again at this meeting, um, thank you for your participation, um, your, your, your dialogue with each other, uh, and uh, this, is, this is kind of the easy stage, as you all recognize. Um, we haven't changed the mass schedule yet, so everybody's understanding the reality. Um, I think communication is probably the biggest um, information. So you saw in the bulletin, we put some of the information out. Um, we'll try to figure out more ways to get that information out. Um, but I think really, I've been, I've been really thinking about this for a long time, not just the mass change, but the whole culture that we're in because these statistics are not new to me, they're not new to a lot of clergy who have been hearing a lot of this for 10 or 20 years, the trend that we are on. Um, so part of, and I wanna share this with you, a lot of what you said today is not different than what the other two meeting groups said. 
Um, but the vision that I've had for this parish, um, and it's a statement that, that I've, we've publicized, and I'm gonna read the statement. I'm also gonna share the, the mission statement of the parish. So the vision statement that I have for the parish is, it was, it was kind of rephrased a little bit by the pastoral council with me, but it really came out of my vision for the parish. And the challenge is, we have all the baby boomers who make everything happen and keep all the wheels going and uh, make everything function well. Um, but we also want, that generation wants to see their faith, their religion, their church survive, right? Into the future. But the challenge is we need the people who are the leaders and the, the people who keep the wheels functioning to adapt dramatically so that the younger generations can see the blessings and the benefit of having the traditions and the practice of our faith and the love for God that we all have. But it's a challenge because the baby leaders don't, they, they all want to change when they were in their 20s. <laughs> now, now they're in their 60s, not so much want that change. But we're going to really kind of appeal to them to really try to accept the change, try to adapt with it, not only because we have to as a, as a matter of reality, but because we want that faith to survive, that faith that we have lived off of and has helped us and nourished us. We want that to help us in the future. So my advice to you and your friends is to be careful how you talk about these meetings and how you consult as somebody, one of the tables even mentioned. You know, we want to try to say, this is a reality, we have to change, but we're going to try to be positive about this Try to, try to accept this as much as we can and help others to accept uh, the changes that we have to go through as much as we can. Um, we only have so much resources and we have to allocate them to the best of our ability. Um, any questions? I'm gonna share the vision statements. Any other questions? Yeah. Just what you said about us be, being more flexible. That is a, such a good statement that I think when you get out to preach on Sunday, that's where you need to go with it to tell us, the older generation, that we need to be flexible, because we're not. But you stated it very well, if you can remember what you said. Well, it's recorded now, actually. <laughs> um, so the vision statement and the mission statement do incorporate that, so I wanna share them with you so you can hear them again. The vision statement, striving to be a community of intentional disciples, welcoming new and young Catholics while serving all so that together we actively and joyfully seek to learn, love, and live our faith in Jesus Christ. And then the mission statement for the parish, currently. Uh, you remember, we, we, we became Holy Family in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic, so listen to this. Holy Family Parish, established in a time of change, is called by the Father and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We seek we seek to bridge established Catholics together with those who are new and young to the faith by sharing the Eucharist, teaching God's word, inspiring service to others, and building a dynamic faith community. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, pray for us. Uh, so um, I'm gonna remind all the table facilitators, please turn in your notes. Um, we'll be uh, assembling all the notes, probably have a committee uh, take all the notes and put that into salient points that we can share um, in the bulletin and other sources what we heard and then um, somehow in the Easter season we'll present some kind of new schedules and uh, you know probably have some more meetings and, and, and see how that goes from there. Okay. Um, yes. I have one more question. How many parishioners are actually registered in all of this? Uh, we have about 15,000. And we only have 1,000? Well, it's 1,700, it was the October count. I think we're actually a little bit higher than that. And as somebody mentioned, we do have a significant number of people live streaming and coming to mass in the parking lot uh, because we, we were technologically more advanced than most parishes before we even started this. So we do have a large number. And there's also almost 1,000 people actually getting our bulletin online. So um, regularly every week it's blocked it out to them. So we do have a lot of people actively engaged in our parish who might not all be coming to church, but they are interested in, in what in the faith and the continuance of the faith too. So. Father Kevin. Yes. You had to say something about closures, but that came up during closures. Yeah, at, at this point we're not talking about church closures. We're, that's not that's not part of our discussion. Um, if 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 we look at a, a one of our mass schedules or more of our mass schedules going forward. And if we're not having a Sunday Mass there, it does not mean we're closing a church. Um, we may have to look at that in the future, but that's not part of this process 
at this point. Okay. Just a quick uh, uh, blessing for everybody. Have a warm and safe day. <laughs> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, thank you, God, for helping us to go through this process for the uh, Sharon Hackman and the, the diocese to help us through this. Thank you for establishing us in the name of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph as Holy Family Parish. And may all of you here get, uh, today have a very safe and blessed remainder of Lent and a joyful celebration of the Easter season. The Lord be with you. And, with and, with you. and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.